Welcome to The Screen Queen, the show where I'll be talking about your favorite show or your favorite movie. You'll just have to find out what you're about to know. This is your Screen Queen, your host, Samantha Parrish. Hello there, and welcome back to the show. As always, this is your host on the East Coast, your Screen Queen, Samantha Parrish. So, school may have just let out, but... Why not talk about a different type of school movie? When I was thinking about Back to School, I had to really think about all of the school-based movies that came out in the 80s because, oh my god, there were a lot of them. I know Animal House kind of rode the wave in 1978, and, and now a lot of things either copied Animal House or was trying to copy Animal House, and they needed to copy more from Animal House to make something as funny as Animal House. And there has been some very unique school movies that has come out, like Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And then, of course, there was Revenge of the Nerds. And I, of course, talked about another school movie on here, Real Genius. And then we had Back to School, which was a little bit different than what we usually saw for school movies. But the ticket to this movie is... Well, I mean, come on. It stars Rodney Dangerfield. That was instant success. The name alone just sold the tickets within five seconds. Rodney Dangerfield just basically played the same dude, but no one ever got tired of him playing the same character all the time. The man was funny within seconds. All he had to do was breathe and people were pissing their pants from laughter. But this is a Rodney Dangerfield movie that isn't as popular as I thought it would be. When I watched it for the first time, there were so many things I recognized and so many people I recognized that I'm like, okay, this is everything in the making of a classic 80s movie or a classic movie in general and has so many things that would be craved for nostalgia. But it really fell into the obscurity of the 80s. Not many people know about this film. Well, even though summer's here, maybe it wouldn't hurt to go back to basics and go back to the 80s with Back to School. Now, I feel like it's imperative that before we jump into this 1980s scholastic classic, there might be some people that have never heard of that movie title a day in their life, and that's okay. We can't see everything, and I will give you the Sammy-fied synopsis for what the movie's about. So the movie follows a melon, a man named Thornton Melon. Thornton runs a successful chain of clothing stores called tall and fat. And I think you can take a wild guess why that demographic is so specific. And with all these successful stores, what else could he need? Well, he needs to help his son. This, his son, Jason, is the light of his life. And when he finds out that Jason is not doing so good in college and is considering dropping out, he doesn't want his son to give up on his education and says, you know what? I'm going to go to college with you. I'm going to start taking classes. And his son goes, Dad, this is crazy. And he's like, this isn't crazy. This is great. And so Thornton begins going back to college. But can you teach an old dog new tricks? Well, <laughs> let's just say Thornton is definitely in for a shocker that uh, the times have changed last he went to school. But does that stop an old dog like him? <laughs> Absolutely not. Oh my God, just thinking about this movie just makes me laugh for the fact that it's not what you think it is. Most school movies have this sort of checklist cliche, you know. I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Name five things that you know happened in school that has always been depicted on TV. You can go ahead and pause, or if you already know it, you can follow along with my answers. The stick in the mud. The bullies. The crush. The, uh, the dire devastation of possibly not passing and then having a big party in the end. If your answers were like mine, you get 100% A+. If you thought of something differently, that's probably not a wrong answer because there are endless cliches for school movies. There are some movies or TV shows like Dawson's Creek or Recess or Greek that followed a lot of those kind of far-fetched schemes, which are good to look at. It's kind of funny to see something that you could picture happening in school or something that would never happen in school but is very 
funny to see what the hijinks would look like. With Back to School, it's an entirely different ballgame where it's a rich guy going to school. The rich guy is like doing pretty good, actually. There's a lot of stuff with the character behind Thornton Mellon where he knows how life works. He's very much aware how hard it took to get here. Um, he's not naive, but there are some things that he just doesn't understand, but he's willing to understand them. Thornton Mellon is a very positive character, but he doesn't come across as a toxic positive character. He does try to fix things with money, and he does try to get through school with money. But if something isn't fixed with money, or he messes something up, he's willing to understand what he did. He doesn't have this outlook that money will solve everything, and that's it. There's a lot of sensitivity around his character that makes him very sweet to see that this is our hero that we're following for the movie. You do want to see Thornton succeed because he's willing to learn. He is willing to take accountability for things that he does wrong or he has to completely embrace a new lifestyle to be able to pass school. He's willing to do what it takes and he will drop anything to pursue what he wants to do in the beginning of the movie. He has an important business call, but he's like, no, man, I want to go talk to my son. You tell them to wait. It was just so, so sweet that this is our introduction to a character that we know has a big heart, a big wallet, but a big ambition as well. When I went back to rewatch the film, I really started to notice the background about Thornton's education, and I had to look at it without the comedic standpoint. The educational background really has a stronger echo to those that had to fight and scrape for their their future without having a degree. And I can't think of too many characters on top of my head that have been a representation of what it's like to self-educate yourself to go into profession where you would need a degree and fought against the odds to achieve that dream. And looking at Thornton's character, he went through so much to be a successful businessman without a degree. He worked hard and did whatever he could and didn't forget his roots. But also knows the value of education and wants his son to have it. And to find out his son wants to quit, he's like, no, you, I want you to go to college. And his son says to him, well, you never went to college and look at you. You're so successful. But Thornton just goes back to say... And education is so important. It's what my father always taught me. And you really feel the weight of that sentence where he wishes he could have gone to college to have the knowledge that wasn't accessible back then or financially able to be accessible. And now here's an opportunity. He's like, you know what? Why not? Let's do this. His son thinks it's absolutely crazy and is very proud of his father for wanting to be late in life and go back to school, which again, that's also the same thing for a lot of people that decided to go back to school late in life and just go into it and take advantage of the opportunity. I love how that was represented with Thornton's character really does speak for the generations that had to fight and scrape so hard when education was valued, but not affordable. And his self-education has a lot of humbleness to it that he didn't forget what it took to get here. He's able to just go ahead and throw money at something, knowing, I have it now, let's go ahead and use it on education. He's, it's amazing to see what that character is like and the way it's defined for many generations. Every conversation you see Thornton have with someone else whenever they've been in, if they've been in an educational field or if they have been just working double shifts, treats them the same way understands what it's like to have to work so hard to get to a position in life and he rewards those that work hard he respects hard work because he knows what it's like you don't have to have an education to know what hard work is but it's nice to recognize someone's hard work whether they worked in their education or worked without education but i want to talk a little bit more about rodney dangerfield being in the movie i mentioned earlier in the episode that rodney dangerfield basically played himself for what, 40, 60 years? I don't know, it feels like a lifetime because unfortunately I was too young to understand who he was, but I had seen him without seeing him. I remember 
they did a parody of him on Aladdin when Robin Williams did the Rodney Dangerfield bit. And there's been other cartoons that have also imitated Rodney Dangerfield. So he does have a permanent imprint on culture that it's just so iconic with him going, Hey, how you doing? What's going on here? I get no respect. I get no, none, no respect. Like that echoes through so much, even after his passing in 2004. But when I actually got the time to know, oh my God, that's the guy from Caddyshack and the impersonation on Aladdin, I decided to kind of go ahead and see what else he did. And well, he definitely had a reputation for playing himself. There was Caddyshack and uh, Back to School. And then following the 90s, there was Rover Dangerfield. Like, you know, that just basically spelled itself. You knew exactly what it was by the title. That it was just a dog version of himself. And sometimes a comedian playing themselves can be a double-edged sword. You're going to get the same thing every time. And you hope to God that it works that people don't get tired of it. Or... If it's the same comedic routine and no one likes it and it's repeated, it's not going to go far. It's going to get old. It's like what Polly Shore did. Even, I hate to say it, I hate to say it, even George Lopez, I kind of felt a little bit overtaxed that it was the same spastic performance every time. That I feel like I'm just watching the George Lopez show over and over and over again. No disrespect to George, it's just... Something I kind of happen to notice, like, okay, here we go again. But with Rodney Dangerfield, it was so funny every time. Everything except for Natural Born Killers. I think that's the only exclusion <laughs> that movie has from this list. Because, oh, fucking shit. That's, that'll be saved for another day. But, damn. Everything else, it was great. It was wonderful that we had someone like Rodney Dangerfield to uplift so many people. And to craft a new way for comedy among the other comedians where it just was an inspiration to see all the stuff that he would do. But my God, the man was just, wow. He worked hard for a lot of his movies and specials. I remember there was a interview he did on Letterman and I want to say it was in the eighties. It was prime Letterman time. And Rodney Dangerfield was just, like, sweating profusely. He had, like, a sweat rag on his shoulder, sweating through his nice suit and everything. Like, it, the anxiety just never stopped for this man. And it makes me appreciate his movies even more, knowing that he was pushing himself when he shouldn't have been. And he wanted to keep going and give 110% for people that needed a laugh. He did all these movies. If they didn't do well... He didn't care. He just went out and did another one. If they weren't well received, he never thought so highly of it. It's In a way, he really emanated the character he played in Back to School because Thornton Mellon was also a guy that was just like, oh, it's nothing. I just wanted to help. It, like, very generous. Always thinking of others, never himself. And that was what Ronnie Dangerfield was like. He always thought of making people laugh. I mean... Realistically, today, it's more celebrated to take a break than pushing yourself, but he knew that a lot of people needed laughter. He really did. But I think now's a good time as ever to go ahead and start talking about, well, one of the strongest points about this movie, which is the debate about school. There's a scene in Back to School that really poses the question, is it really worth going to college when I'm going to be learning something that I might not even use. So I'm going to paint the scene for you. Thornton is taking a business class with his son, Jason, and they have a professor that's been going into major details, all these details in the details about what it's like to do a business. And Thornton, God bless him, he can't help it, but he has to point out some stuff that he knows about the business trade that's different than what the professor knows, and becomes a clash of two people that one of them has always known the the numbers and the digits, the, the exact science behind a business, and then you have someone else that has a different experience with having to find loopholes. The things that he was taught back in school weren't going to be the answer to solve the issues in his business and had to find ways around it. And, you know, when you go into a business, you have to think on your feet that 
time is money. You got to figure out how you're going to be able to get this done. It can't always be relied upon what you learned in school and you learn your own way of going around the profession. And sure enough, the students turn their attention away from the professor and they start taking notes about everything Thornton is saying about what it's actually like to run a business. That this is information that's going to benefit them. That's the information that people truly need. Not the stats, but the experience to have it verified to know what they're getting into. There are some people that can tell you what something is like as a definition, but to actually have an experience as a definition, it's going to teach people a lot more so that way they can evaluate them for themselves to go, huh, maybe this is something I don't want to go into knowing that's what the reality is like to have to cut loopholes or, oh, this is going to help me when I eventually get in my own business knowing that this is what I'm going to have to do. They're learning better from him. Now, with that scene said, there's been a lot of shit in the news that talks about, is it really worth it to go to college, knowing that you're going to have a degree that you can't even use? I have a lot of friends that went to school and they can't use their degree. It's basically just a little mouse pad for them at this point. I have some friends that weren't able to finish school and they had to hang it up or they're just putting their education on the back burner until they're able to financially and mentally go back to school. But a lot of my friends and that whole mishmash of examples I gave have all felt that some of the things they learned in class doesn't really hold up into our everyday life. Or you go to college for two to four years to get one piece of information that you can't even use. And it kind of feels like, okay, I just spent all this money to have something that is just going to exist with me. And it's not going to help me in my job profession or I have to hang on for years until said profession finally comes my way. It's, like I said, it's different strokes for different folks that, uh, depending on what they're willing to do, how much time they're willing to sacrifice, how important their education is to them, and the way that they have understood what's ahead of them. We see someone like Thornton Mellon that is someone that does feel like a representation of those that want to get to a comfortable place in life that haven't forgotten their roots and knows what life is ahead of them and have had to learn to do a business basically from scratch. And then for him to go to school with his son and say what he knows about the business to, well, help others not be deprived of their own life knowing that there's an easier way to get through stuff and that's the wonderful thing about the way the education system has been going these days is that it does feel like a pay it forward thing where people that can't afford to go to college are given the one answer that they didn't have to spend thirty to fifty thousand dollars to get i have a lot of author friends that went to school to be an author or a writer or an editor and then they end up like utilizing their gifts and their stuff to help out others that can't go to school. Um, I have a wonderful friend named Dylan Cologne that also took like all these seminars and classes and then was able to give me a Dylan-fied version of that so I could be able to learn what to do for my books and I myself. I didn't go to school to be an author. I didn't go to college and I also wasn't the best student. I did not have a good time during school, so the idea of college wasn't very appealing to me. And then at the time when I graduated high school, times got very tough for my mother, and I decided to put my studies on hold in certain trade schools to go get a job and help out my mom. And I don't regret that I did that because it definitely shaped me as the hard worker that I am today. And over the years, I found out that college just wasn't meant for me. I had to think long and hard about it for the fact that I have never been comfortable with school. And I found out along the way that I did not need a college degree to be an author. And that gave me the biggest sense of relief. But at the same time, there are some core things from an education in college that I knew I needed to know. And it was practically dangled in front of my face half the time. Uh, it felt like that old commercial, like, oh, you almost had it. You better be quicker than that. That's what it felt like. And it was so frustrating. And then along the way, I found some people that were able to help me 
find out what it was I needed to know without going to college. And in turn, I end up having some friends that taught me what to do to help me as an author. And then I gave that to someone else in trying to just keep paying that forward, that it still echoes the education, that education is still important, but it doesn't keep people in the dark or restrict them from something that's going to help them in their future. So in a way, we're kind of all like Thornton Melons, where we learn something and we're just trying to carry it on to help others to keep going with their dreams, to not give up, but know that there's like a more simplified definition that can be able to be given to someone to just keep them going. You don't need this big grandusk kind of professor saying things where it's like, hey, just do this and you're good. It's, it's nice. But it is nice though that it's a college movie to look at to not feel so intimidated by it, that it's okay if you have to do things a little bit differently. Everyone moves at their own pace and they all learn in their own way. And on top of my head, next to something like Real Genius, there aren't too many movies that have an identity like that where you know these characters feel like you know them in real life that they go through things that you have gone through during school or you had friends like that during school but it still had its own identity to still commentate on a lot of things within the education system and having people that had to do something a little bit differently college is not a one-size-fits-all for a lot of people and if you do go to college it's like you kind of have to learn to do things your own way like don't just toss aside your own morals and everything still continue to do what you can and take what you want from education and go from there i have always found it a little bit strange that back to school wasn't hailed as one of those strive for school movies like there are so many out there that have this message about like going back to school and getting your education there is a lot of relatability with thornton that it doesn't matter if you need a degree or not but just to achieve something stay with something and complete something it's like a copy paste movie that you can put whatever uh you know end game ambition there and sort of follow the coattails of of thornton a lot of people have a little bit of like the ambition that Thornton Mellon has that no matter how it's going to get done, it's going to get done. But with that said, I'm kind of surprised that Thornton Mellon didn't really become like an iconic character for a lot of people that he really does relate to. He's not perfect, but he's trying. But it's the comedic thing that kind of hurts that whole aspect of it, even though I love what Rodney Dangerfield did as Thornton. I love the humor he has behind it, and the humor does go hand in hand with his character to combat life with comedy, just to shrug everything off and get through things and not get so overwhelmed or overtaxed and to accept life and cope with life in a very good way. But at the same time, because it's Rodney Dangerfield, the, the comedy kind of distracts away from some of those very integral parts of the themes and morals of the movie with pursuing your education. If you see like a younger person do it, it's like, oh, oh my gosh, so inspiring. But it's Rodney Dangerfield, so it's like, oh, laughter. Oh, so funny. You still root for him, but you're also kind of laughing more than uh, be really being able to see the bigger picture here. I mean, it would not work without the comedy, but it's the double-edged sword. There's always going to be something that distracts in the film and kind of goes back and forth. And I thought about that and realized that Real Genius went through the exact same thing. It had a younger, well, you know, very young char characters in there that were going through their studies and they got kind of beaten down by life, but they kept going. And that also had a comedic edge with the character Chris Knight that I discussed in the Real Genius episode. But I, it really doesn't matter. It just had rotten timing. Both of those films had rotten timing. Back to School was coming out in a time where School movies were still being made, but they were like a dime a dozen. And it was just kind of a oddball pick that people kind of predicted the film knowing, oh, it's Rodney Dangerfield, I know it's going to be funny. Or they see it and it just didn't really get the accolades, the proper accolades that it would have today. It still fell into a hole and it's not talked about as much as it should, but one day it will. Just like with Real Genius or other cult movies, they have a weird way of becoming a cult classic. It just kind of happens out of nowhere. And I'll be waiting for that day 
when it just comes out of nowhere that people can't stop quoting this movie and they can't stop talking about it. That'll be really funny to see, to see how this movie aged. I'm sure it would make Rodney Dangerfield very happy as well as the others in this film because this movie has too many famous people in there and it kind of hurts that no one really knows a whole lot about it. You could throw a dart and you're probably able to find someone famous today that was in this movie. It's just like, I wouldn't consider this like a time capsule of the 80s where it has people that are iconic to the decade, but they're just iconic in general. That's really the best way I can put it. And you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when I start naming the names. So right from the get-go, I gotta talk about the fact that Robert Downey Jr. was in this movie. Little baby Downey Jr. Oh my god, it was like before... He was in Less Than Zero and before he did Chaplin. Like, to see this is the earliest 80s movie for Robert Downey Jr. And seeing he hasn't aged a fucking day, even after all the drugs he took. Shit, man. Oh my god, like, ah, uh, it's, it's... Every time I show this movie to my friends, I'm like, guess what? Baby Iron Man is in this film. And their jaws just drop. Seeing early Tony Stark is so fucking funny. But damn. Robert Downey Jr. is so good in this movie that it almost parallels Rodney Dangerfield. Like, on a scale of 1 to 10, 9.5 is where Robert Downey Jr. stands at. Like, he has to back off a little bit. He's not the main focus of the movie, but his chemistry and his presence is so great that you knew, oh yeah, this guy's destined for things. He's gonna hit a couple of roadblocks, but eventually, I don't know, maybe Marvel will pick him up. <laughs> And the way that his humor is in the movie as the character, let me pull it up real quick on IMDb. Get me one hot second real quick. Oh, Derek. The way that he plays Derek in the film as the best friend, but he doesn't feel like an overwhelming best friend. He's a persnickety guy, but he's not a rude man. He takes cues. He helps out Jason. Uh, he is the go-to guy for anything. He's such a wonderful character in the movie, and it's so wonderful to see that he's not cliched. His character is a one-of-a-kind. There are many, like, things that he does in the film that I love where there's a bar brawl going on, and he's the <laughs> was the cause of the brawl. And sure enough, like, someone comes to his defense, he goes into the fray, he ends up getting caught by Thornton's limo driver, and he just says, like, oh my god, Lou, been waiting for you. Where you been? Like, <laughs> it's so fucking funny. There's so many things in this movie that, like, I can't even say. You just have to experience it. That's how great his performance is in the film. I really wish people celebrated that this film of Robert Downey Jr. is more. As much as he's great in Zodiac and Iron Man and so many other things, this one just kind of got lost in time, and I hope people find this performance of his. But... Robert Downey Jr. is also best friends with, or close friends, with another person in the movie who played the villain. I, I saw this from the get-go. I could be blind and deaf and see this actor and know where he was from. William Zabka plays the villain in the film. And if you don't know the name, you probably know a certain little iconic 80s movie called The Karate Kid... And another TV show revival called Cobra Kai. Yes, Johnny Lawrence plays the villain in this film. And I immediately saw it and I was like, Johnny Lawrence. But that actually created a problem for William Zabka playing another villain. William Zabka has gone on to recount that this was the pivotal part in his career that he realized if he didn't change his characters, he was going to be a typecast villain because he's been playing villains in the 80s. I mean, the most iconic being Karate Kid, but that makes sense. I literally pointed the screen and just went, Johnny Lawrence. So I'm glad that he realized something at that time. But there's also some funny stories that he shared during this time at Back to School where he and Robert Downey Jr. would get high off of pot and they would talk about how Christopher Walken is so awesome. Like... <gasps> I guess they learned a lot on that set, I bet. <laughs> but there are some other familiar faces, one of which 
I still can't believe was not recognized or remembered was Ned Beatty being in the movie. That man has always had a, like, a very interesting career being, like, the side character or the most important character that deserves the Anne title. He was a very great actor, but still, I'm surprised that no one really remembered he was in this film. It just kind of got shoved off. He does a great job playing the dean that's very happy to get more funding for his school. He's not really, like, a major, like, layered character, but that's not the point to him. He's just there, and shit, I'm kind of glad he is. It's great having Ned Beatty in the movie just giving his general charisma and very wholesome energy to this film. It just adds a lot without even having to try. There is another very famous and dearly missed person from this film and sadly this film does kind of represent one of the last few things we got before his passing sam kinnison plays the professor in this film and my god i'm not a big fan of school movies but that that character is the best professor i have seen next to something like robin williams in goodwill hunting this felt like a parody of professors to see a character like sam kinnison being very quiet and reserved and then I know where he does his signature yelling. So you have like two comedians in the film basically playing themselves. But with the time we have with Sam Kinison in this film, I never forgot. It sticks out so much in all the best ways with him being a professor. It would never happen. But what if it did? Like that is pretty funny seeing someone like Sam Kinison playing a professor. Oh my goodness. It's just, it's nice that we have that exist with Sam Kinison's career that even though he didn't have a very long time with us on the earth and he had a very lesser time being an actor, well, I'm glad they nabbed him for this movie. And from what I hear, Rodney Dangerfield specifically nabbed him for the movie knowing that we needed to have his comedic presence in the film to kind of balance things out so it's not just Rodney Dangerfield's comedy being the main headrunner of the movie. It feels a lot more balanced that we're able to kind of take a break from Ronnie Dangerfield's comedy and get to see something else. And I like a comedian that's able to be like, hey, I'm not the only one around her that can make people laugh. Let's get some more people on board. So I want to name a few more names before I get out the big bad one that I have been saving. Uh, Burt Young is also in the film. He plays Lou, the limo driver, a.k.a. my favorite character. Uh, then there's Terry uh, Farrell who has been known for Star Trek. There's also another Star Trek person on here named Robert Picardo. And there's Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Again, not an actor, but you'll get why he's in the movie if you've ever seen it. Edie McClurg, who a lot of Disney fans will know her as um, Carl Carlotta from Little Mermaid and just anything in Disney. And there's Adrian Barbeau, who's mostly from the horror movie world, so that kind of shocked me she was here but damn she's so good no wonder she was in the film for a small spell and then finally the big baddie of them all the thing that pushed this movie and even got featured in the music video oingo boingo is in the film now if you don't know what I'm talking about. Oingo Boingo was a short-lived band from the 80s, but it's mainly remembered because Danny Elfman, Tim Burton's music man, is the is a part of the band and did Oingo Boingo and had a couple of hits in the 80s. He did Weird Science and he did the song Dead Man's Party for the film. And oh my God, oh my God. That song I want played at my wedding, my funeral, and probably any other event after that. If I could be able to have a holiday to this song, I would make that possible. It is one of the most underrated 80s songs I've ever heard in my life. And I love that decade with every part of my soul that I hope has not been corrupted yet. <laughs> and, oh my goodness. I was so shocked, like... When I saw the music video. The music video is the sole reason why I know about this movie. I'm sitting there and I'm like, is that Rodney Dangerfield? Is that, is that Robert Downey Jr.? What am I watching? And sure enough, when I look at the music video, you know, I gotta watch the movie. And, well, 
here we are. So Oingo Boingo is the reason why I know this film. But it's so shocking, like, to see it in its time capsule, like, looking at it without my love for the song and for the movie and looking at it from a historical standpoint. That is pretty interesting that this is the earliest of Danny Elfman before he would be known for his works in Tim Burton movies. Like, it's kind of nice to see how this exists, especially for so many people that are major Tim Burton fans but have also recognized Danny Elfman and what he does. It's kind of nice to see what he can do here. He doesn't normally do a lot of singing for movies. Uh, last I heard that he sung so powerfully for uh, the movie Corpse Bride that he almost lost his voice. So it's like, shit. So I'm glad that I have Back to School and Corpse Bride as like great examples of seeing his singing in the film. But it is so funny to actually see that... Danny Elfman and the Oingo Boingo band made it into the film during the frat house party. I, I, I love how that goes hand in hand that the scene from the movie does match the music video where it just kind of feels like the same thing to get these snippets of the film and marry the two together. Absolutely great. And it's a fucking banger, man. If you haven't heard it, oh my God, there's no going back. It will be in your head for the rest of your life and you'll be happy that you have it. But... Because the song Dead Man's Party is about the Day of the Dead, and it's a really unique conception they did with Claymation to represent the Day of the Dead, it makes me wonder if Tim Burton was at home, saw the movie, and was like, oh, hmm, he might be a little strange like me. I'll have to ask him if he wants to work on a certain superhero-themed movie with me before I ask Prince. I don't know how it happened, but I like to think that that's... Maybe one of the ways that these two found each other. I'm sure I'll find that out one day whenever we do cover a Tim Burton movie. But he was bound to make music for the Burton movies. Now, I do find it a little bit funny and ironic that I just now realize that this episode is going to come out on Father's Day. And this is a film that has another storytelling element that is centered around family to the core of it, it's Rodney Dangerfield going back to school and hijinks ensue. But the core of the film is mainly built around Thornton's relationship with his son, Jason, which is one of the driving factors of the film that kind of gets quieted over the comedy. But looking at it without the comedic standpoints, it's damn sweet. He's going back to school with his son when he finds out his son wants to quit. He stays with him every step of the way. He wants to have classes with him. Jason's not ashamed of his father going back to school and is proud of him wanting to keep up with the times, go back to school, get everything figured out. It's a wonderful little dynamic where you can see their bond that they have where they look like best friends. You know, it's wonderful to have a relationship with your parent where you, you can just talk about anything. I have that with my mom. I have that with my grandfather. The way that Jason talks to Thornton is the same way I talk to my grandfather. It's, it's, it's amazing to see that representation where not all father-son dynamics depicted in film or any kind of media needs to have this sappy, sugar-coaty feeling to get the love across. Like, when you just know someone, that gets the love across. And there's so many moments where you get to see how Jason is understanding his father a bit more and how Thornton wants to understand Jason in this whole new thing. Like their relationship has never felt altered or it's never fallen flat or was on the rocks. It was just a little bumpy thing that they got through with communication. And that's, that's wonderful for that to exist in 1986. That's pretty great. But there is one more fatherly moment that I want to emphasize and it's about the character Lou, who is the right-hand man and driver for Thornton, a.k.a. my favorite character. There's a third act breakup in the film where Jason's all hell-bent and mad and getting in his feelings about uh, college, everything, his dad, like, it just overtaxed him. And he's about to just be done with everything. And Lou is the one to kind of give the words of wisdom in his own way. I love me a scene where you don't go for the traditional cliches to get a point across. You use a personal story to get the point across. Lou goes up to Jason and he just explains about a favor that Thornton did for him. Helping Lou get his boys 
through life. And having that respect to be helped as a dad by Thornton, despite coming from different walks of life. Thornton never forgot his roots and wanted to help Lou with his situation that was similar to where Thornton's father was at at some point. You know, looking at the tight dynamic. And so, Lou explains to Jason, he said, and I quote, I put one through college and I put the other one through the wall. That just kind of sums it up right there where it's like the tough decisions to make as a father that you want to provide for your children and the fact that he had help to provide for his children and still has that loyalty to Thornton for that one act he did. That like spoke volumes about their dynamic to give that layers. It's a small scene that has so many layers when you really look at how everything is connected. It's kind of funny to make such a high connection in a... In a, in a comedic movie like Back to School, but if you look at it, it's a very sweet fatherly moment to get the point across about what it's like to be in a father's shoes. And it's great for that. I love that. I, I love that part of the film. It might just be me emphasizing this so much, whole thing, but I just figured I'd go ahead and bring it across. And a weird way to sum it up, Back to School is one of those movies that feels like like a summer movie but it doesn't entirely feel like a school movie. It's serious enough to get its points across, but it's not so serious that you can't have fun with it. It has that perfect balance to have some heart and soul, but then you also get to have some wholesome and humor, humorous moments. It's not trying to overachieve anything, which is, you know, ironic considering the scholastic ties of the movie. It's not overachieving anything. It's not trying to be the best school movie. It's just trying to be a school movie. Something that's fun. It's not trying to shove something in someone's face about uh, academics or uh, going through life. It's just a moment that people go through life when they're trying to achieve something, that life has many different twists and turns. Thornton never thought that he was going to go back to school, but when he did, he's like, screw it, I'll go for it. That sounds great. He wasn't striving to be the best over-the-top student, and he had a very weird way of learning, but that's the whole point, is that everyone has a different way to learn. And there aren't many movies that teach that. It's mostly you have to learn things this way. Instead, it's trying to tell you, learn things your way. And then everything's up to yourself about what you want to take away from the film and what you want to learn from it. Or don't learn anything. Have fun. It's just one of those films that you can take it for what it is. You don't have to take it for face value. You can take any part of this film and find enjoyment out of it. Whether you're going to be watching this film for... Uh, the humorous parts of it, or you want to watch it for the scholastic part of it. As long as it's entertaining you, well, I think that's the best lesson to take away from it. So before I officially close out the episode, there's one more story that I want to share that I have, I've had no way to segue this in. So this needs just to exist as a little bonus point. The woman in the film that plays Thornton Mellon's love interest is Sally Kellerman. And she's not really a name that you would know. She's honestly not a name that I, like, keep in my movie buff database. But she was still a part of the industry. And she was a part of some very memorable things. Mostly MASH. But other than that, the woman kept working until she retired. And she was a lot of things besides an actress. She was a musician. There were songs wrote for her. And she was also a stand-up comedian. And back in 1981, she performed stand-up at an evening at the Improv. Jim Carrey was the next act after her. And I found that just so cool that I just, I could not help myself but to share it in this episode. But then it also made me think that technically there are three comedians in this movie, and my god, Thinking on that now, I'm surprised that I didn't catch the cues from her performance that she does have a background in comedy with her comedic timing and the things that she does. Like, shit. It, it really, like, made me so much more impressed by what she does as an entertainer, but it also makes me sad that, like, that's all we have left of her now after her passing in 2022. But I just couldn't help myself but just share that one last little story about when the people from back to school. So thank you so much for staying for that bonus point. But now it is the time to find out what the next episode is going to be on the screen queen. 
So looking at my calendar, we have room for one more episode. Now I did say that I would be taking the last week off of every uh, month for the summer to give myself a break, but a promise is a promise. And I also said that at some point in June, I would have a LGBTQIA episode of a gay culture movie. So I went through my entire full box of selections, piece by piece, title by title. And I covered a majority of my titles during my birthday month with the Birdcage and Tu Wong Fu, but I was able to find four suggestions for the end of Pride Month. So I put them all in this tiny little container and we're about to find out what the next episode is going to be on the screen, Queen. Here we go. Let me just... I feel like a bartender of what I'm doing here. Okay, I got one. What are you? Aw, oh, shit. Oh, this is gonna be a... Oh. Okay, it's gonna be a heavy one, but honestly that this one does seem like a perfect title and I, I think it's not hard to see why just with the title alone. So the next episode on the screen queen is going to be Philadelphia. That is one hell of a way to go out for pride month. Whew. I got to bring the thunder and the lightning for that one. Okay. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of The Screen Queen. It is a joy and an honor to be your host. If you would like to catch up with me in between uploads, you can shoot me some movie recommendations and TV show recommendations at my Instagram, at the Queen of the Screen. And if you'd like to see some funny stuff I put up on TikTok, you can find me at The Mystical Space Witch. And if you would like to check out my book series, Inglorious Inc., you can find it on Amazon, but I have a direct link for you. A direct link for you, excuse me. I might have to go back to school because I don't know how to talk anymore. You can find all of that in the description box. Thank you, as always, for tuning in. This is your host, signing off. Bye bye